All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming today. So this is uh, the Keeping Up with LTS uh, Linux Kernel Functional Testing on Devices. And just to introduce myself quickly, uh, my name is uh, Tom Gall. I'm the director of the Lenaro Mobile Group. And so what I want to just kind of start the talk off very, very quickly is touching on a little bit about what is Lenaro and sort of who we are. Um, so we're sort of like a consortium of companies that get together and we do collaborative engineering. Um, so kind of the idea uh, with Lenaro is you have these member companies, they basically decide, hey, this is a, uh, a priority in the open source world. We, they throw in uh, some of their employees, we have some of our own Lenaro employees, and we work on various projects and kind of solve problems, if you will. Um, we're primarily involved with the, the ARM ecosystem, that's really our, our, our big area of focus. Um, but we work all across a wide variety of open source projects. And so that's everything from, you know, Linux kernel, as you know and expect, and Android, and, um, you know, kind of the, the, the smaller name stuff, too, that would be strategic towards, uh, towards various kinds of things. And so this particular project here, and what I'm going to talk about is LKFT and something called Project Sharp. And starting out with a little bit of the background information, um, so when it comes to Linux kernel on devices, and specifically I'm going to talk about the Android space in particular, of course we've got the Android common kernel. And the Android common kernel these days largely tracks to LTS kernel releases. So that's 4.4.4.9 and now 4.14. Um, it also tracks mainline as well. And so upstream of that, of course, you've got the, the LTS community, which is working on everything from the current 4.15 stable to um, the 4.4 long term. Um, and then, of course, mainline itself and, and Linux Next itself. So you end up having these, you know, sort of almost waterfall of past kernels that are still getting fixes applied to them in their LTS versions, as well as the mainline, which, of course, is everybody's main focus. So all that said, if you go and you take a look at Android devices today, um, so I've, I've got a couple of uh, screenshots here from a couple of, uh, of devices, and I'm not going to name names or, or shame anybody. That's really not the purpose of the talk. But um, one of these, and it's a bit of an eye test, is running a 4.413 kernel. And if you look really, really closely, they built that kernel on January 25th of this year. So 4.13, if you don't remember, came out on June 8th of 2016. That was a long time ago. Now certainly, you know, this is a responsible company. They've been cherry picking, you know, security fixes and, and pulling down some things which are relevant. But they've left a lot of the LTS fixes behind. Um, that's, that's not great news. Now, the other one here is, is better. Um, it's a 4478, but still, that's all going all the way back to Jan, or June, July 21st of 2017. So that's almost nine months ago. That's still missing you know, nine months of LTS fixes. And the thing about LTS in particular is the LTS project, the long-term support project, it doesn't do anything to label security fixes. Um, so if there's a surge or something like that, sure, you know, that's, that's an obvious thing, but there can be fixes that go into LTS that it fixes a security issue, it also fixes a bug, and it may not be labeled as such. So unless you're really, really smart at picking up some of that stuff, you can be missing things. Um, the other thing that's very important to keep in mind is when LTS as a project releases, it doesn't test anything um, but all of the patches included in one one, one tarball as of one release. It doesn't test anything having to do with cherry picking. So when you're taking a patch out of the context of LTS, you're really losing out on all of the testing that's gone in and around the kernel engineering that's happened for that particular patch. So, you know, that's, that's an area of risk. Okay, so all that said, let's get into now kind of the point of the project and what I really want to talk about today, and that's something called Project Sharp and something called LKFT. And the goal of these two activities together is to catch kernel regressions. What we want to do is across the architectures that are using LTS kernels and then their direct downstreams like the Android common kernel is essentially make a promise to say that we're not breaking the kernel, we're not introducing any regressions, and that that kernel is just as good as the prior LTS release. So this goes across 4.4, 4.9, 4.14, current stable, mainline, um, that we want to be vigilant in watching for, for regressions. 
Um, it also spans architectures. So while Lenaro is primarily interested in the ARM architecture, we knew when we took on this project that we couldn't just test on ARM to be, uh, you know, to be taken seriously in what we were trying to do. We also had to include x86, and we also have to be open to other architectures as well. And you know, this project is essentially, um, it was slideware one year ago. So in this past year, in you know, what I'm to be talking about is, is what's been accomplished in that period of time. The other thing that we've, we know is very important too is the use of compilers. Now, in, you know, for the most part, across the, uh, the Linux universe, you know, GCC is the reigning king compiler that's used. But in the Android space, as it turns out, um, the switch over to Clang has begun quite a while ago for applications, and now it's happening for kernel development as well. So when it comes to finding kernel regressions, we need to take into account multiple different kernel, or multiple different compiler versions, as well as multiple different compilers themselves between Clang and GCC. Um, the other thing that we set as a goal is we have to keep up with the LTS um, community as a project. And so what'll happen is, is when an RC gets introduced, so this is a set of candidate patches um, that will constitute the next uh, LTS release, we basically have about a 48 hour window to pick up all of those patches, build them for all of the architecture and OS combinations that we're going to test, submit those tests, get the results, and then do some level of initial triage on the data that comes back. And if there are issues, we need to have you know, a pretty bright line um, to report what the regression is to be effective in the LTS community. Uh, so that was a very key thing that we, we needed to do. Um, now by taking on this kind of activity, what this does is this helps uh, make LTS kernels you know, I, I like to use the word more viable, but it also makes them you know, re more realistic for long-term uh, projects and products and those kinds of things. So you know, there's been a bit of trade um, press stories about the 4.4 LTS kernel lasting for six years. We don't want to see that just for the 4.4 kernel. We also want to see that for 4.9. We also want to see that for 14, so that when you have a company that is you know, either putting out a phone or something else in this space, they know that they're gonna, they can rely on a fixed stream for any one of those kernel re LTS kernel releases to be around and seeing fixes for some time. Okay, and then when you have a, a set of data that's coming from the, uh, the testing activity, um, the other thing that we need to do as a project, is, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we need to be able to triage that data and we wanna keep track of that data for historical purposes and we'll see why in a minute why that's um, interesting and important and empowering for developers. Um, but it also means that we ourselves have to, at a minimum, do the triage. We have to sign ourselves up for that on a week-to-week -week basis and while we may be looking for help from the community, we know that we may or may not get it. Okay, now, um, as with science, um, you know, there's the common saying you've probably heard where we all stand on the, solder, on the shoulders of giants, and there are numerous other, you know, kind of kernel testing activities that are out there. So when we started KL, LKFT, one of the things that we had to ask ourselves is, do we start from kernel CI? Do we build that capability in kernel CI? Or do we start with something new? We're, you know, what kind of set of pieces are we going to do? So we kind of had to go through this initial sort of um, exercise as far as what was the right thing to get the project off the ground, get results, and be effective as quickly as possible. And so for us, unfortunately, that meant that we, need to do, we needed to do an initial sort of break from kernel CI, but knew that going on in the future that we initially wanted these two projects to kind of come back together again at some point in time as that made sense. So kernel CI, for those who may not be fully um, up to speed on what that does, primarily what they're doing is, is they're doing boot testing. Um, and you know, so they have a minimal amount of user space or operating system that is sitting on top of the kernels that they're testing. Now they have gone so far as to start to enable case self-test, um, but when we're running our test suites, um, like LTP and stuff like that, these are things that tend to have a lot of um, software requirements in order to run. So that means we need a substantial OS that's gonna be able to support those test suites and, and be able to, to work efficiently as opposed to something when kernel CI, which um, is, is fairly cut down. Um, the other thing about kernel CI is, of course, it is a community, and so they have community-driven goals, they have community-driven consensus, and for us, we wanted to just hit the ground running as quickly as possible. So 
we figured if we were going to be working through kernel CI, we might have a little bit of a slower track, and maybe that was the wrong assumption on our part, but that was something that was a bit of a con concern for us. Another thing that was important to us as well was the hardware side of things. So kernel CI has a very vast set of boards within their farms. They really have a, a very um, incredible amount of hardware at their beck and call. We knew because of what we wanted to test and how we wanted to test and, and the operating systems involved that it was probably going to be a, a small subset of boards. And so, again, that's a little bit different than what, what kernel CI does. Okay, so moving quite along then, so LKFT, and I'm not going to read, read this chart here, but it's certainly available on the slides that are attached with the, um, attached to the schedule, is we really wanted to make sure that we would set up a system that was going to go from git, git repositories to emailed results, um, you know, and kind of set up a whole infrastructure. And so that infrastructure looks largely um, like this, where you have um, a Git tree, which is ultimately monitored. So in the case of the LTS trees, that's Greg Carr Hartman's trees. In the case of Android Common Kernel trees that we work with, that of course comes from the AOSP project. Um, as those things change, we detect that change. We kick off builds inside of Jenkins. Um, that then results in a bunch of test jobs, which are then shipped off to Lava. Um, and then Lava will dispatch this all across our board farm. Uh, Tests are often, in the case of larger, more um, complicated test suites like LTP, they're sharded so that we're running subsections of LTP at a time. We're not running all of LTP on one board. We, we chunk it up into pieces. And then those results, of course, get pulled into a database. That database then is made available to something called Squad. And then Squad puts out both a web UI as well as an email report that then ultimately goes up to the upstream community. Um, we don't generally, I should say, in the early days, we didn't just kick out the, the, the report. Um, we would kind of hold it back and, you know, sort of not trust it and, and really kind of look out for things um, like false positives and flaky test cases and um, just kind of all sorts of things that were a little distrusting of the system until we had put a lot of time under our belt. So, you know, here we are a year later. We're, we're very confident in our results. And so from an RC out to um, reporting results, we're looking at about an eight-hour turnaround time. Um, and that's, that's taken quite a bit to get there. Um, this infrastructure that I just talked about is largely completely open. It's all, you know, open source pieces. Um, and the individual parts of the system are all out on the web. Um, so if you go into kernel CI, or I should say ci.linero.org, you can see the jobs as they're coming in. Uh, you can watch the board farm in lkft.validation.linero.org, and then the reports that um, are kicked out, you can go directly to the web interface, or if you watch the Linux stable project, you'll see those things um, get reported by um, the Linero folks. So um, there's a few people that'll, that'll uh, post them by um, by hand, even though they're, um, you know, kicked out by the system automatically. Um, okay, so just to put this in statistical terms here, so any time a 4449, 4, 414, 415 4, mainline or next set of changes lands, um, that's going to kick off some set of builds, and those builds depend on the board and the operating system combinations and, of course, the kernel version, as well as the test case version that you're going to ultimately run. So you got several different things that you don't want changed or you want to minimize change and you put, have to put all those things together into a build. And then once those builds are all done um, or as they seriously, seriously get completed, then we'll kick them off into the lava farm. So that's ultimately about 20 lava jobs per kernel version. And then that's about 5,500 individual tests that are ultimately going to be run again per kernel version. So it's a lot of activity when you see a, a, a new LTS release happen or a new RC out on mainline or what have you. It uh, uh, generates some activity. So that activity shows up in, in uh, this. So this is LKFT. Um, it's a bit of an eye chart here, but down here at the bottom, there's a list of boards that, are, that data is getting kicked off of. So this is a, a, a screenshot of an active day that was uh, in February. So at this time, you know, we've got some B2260 boards from ST. We've got uh, Dragonboard 410C from Qualcomm. We've got the, 
the high keyboard, which is a high silicon device, um, a Juno R2, which is a, a dev board from ARM. Uh, they're about, they're, they're fairly expensive, um, but they're nice boards. There's QM, we've got QMU, and so in this case, we do QMU for x86, but we're about to get both ARM 32 and ARM 64 running on the QMU environment as well. Um, X15 was just a 32-bit ARM device from TI, and then, of course, good old bog standard x86 devices. And so, you know, of course, these queues will fill up as um, the lava jobs land, things get dispatched, and ultimately then we'll, we'll start to see some results. So now I kind of want to go into a little bit of the, uh, the reporting side of the, the talk. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about some of our experiences along the way building the system and uh, what we've sort of discovered. So one of the things that hit us initially early on was is, okay, across all these different dev boards that are out here, um, different dev boards with different connectors are actually hard to scale up. Um, we have a standard called 96 boards, and as it, you know, the nice thing about 96 boards is all of the connectors are in the same place, and so everything is more or less standard. So that makes the, that particular board design really nice and really easy to, to kind of set up in a system like this. Um, so that, that's, our, that's a really good quality to have um, when you're trying to build a system like this at scale. Um, reliability doesn't just happen. You, you end up having to write some checks for above average hardware. Uh, we had a problem because we had low quality um, USB cables at one time. And you know how that would show up in the environment is, well, 10% of your test jobs are just falling over and exploding in large mushroom clouds off into the ditch. What's going on? You know, is this a kernel bug? Is this a test case bug? Is this, you know, and trying to ferret that out is really annoying until you realize, oh, this cable here is a piece of junk, throw it away, let's build something, you know, pick something out here that's actually some decent quality. Um, USB hubs was actually another thing that was very important that we found. Uh, we have seen variability in USB hubs where low quality stuff will again cause boards to look like they're failing when in fact it's not the board's problem, it's the hub's fault. So that was something where again skipping on, on hardware really cost us time and energy and we had to learn through um, the school of hard knocks that that was something not to skimp on. Um, firmware updates. So uh, board manufacturer will come along and say, well, we've got a new and updated firmware. Maybe it manages power a little bit better than the old one did or uh, does something better with booting or what have you. And changes in that firmware can just cause us to go crazy because what oftentimes can happen is, is that um, those firmware changes can include changes to the interfaces. And so those interfaces are something that the system ultimately will integrate with, and so, you know, if anything changed in, for instance, how you partition the board or ship something down or ultimately work with that board, the environment now has to catch up to how the firmware just changed, and that takes time. Somebody's got to come up to speed on that and understand what those changes are and what that means in, inside of the system itself. So, you know, we would love to see standardization in that space in particular, um, but it's, it's something that clearly we're not there. Uh, okay, uh, another area that we had from a device perspective is, you know, each board that we're going to connect into the system, there's actually four cables that go into that particular device. So you've got serial, you've got OTG, you've got Ethernet or power. Um, ideally, sometimes you just have Wi-Fi. Um, you've got your power brick that you've got to deal with, and, you know, that ends up being a, a mess of spaghetti that is not fun to, to deal with in a lab environment. Okay, so um, the other area that I want to talk a little bit about is some of the test suites that we, that we use. Um, so case health test was a, a natural one that we turned to. Um, this is, of course, the, um, the Linux kernel's internal test suite. Um, it's, a, it's a good test suite. It's still not something that all of the Linux kernel sub-maintainers um, contribute to or necessarily believe in, but you know, that's you know, hopefully something that will get figured out in time. Uh, one of the things that we do, though, is we use the latest version of K-Self-Test across the board. So that means we'll take a 4.15 version of K-Self-Test and we will run that on top of 4.4. We'll run it on top of 4.9. And that was a little bit of a controversial change. And we had gone out to the community and said, tell us what the right thing to do is. And I'll give us some direction here. Um, 
and it doesn't seem like that there's a really a good way one way or another because the problem is is that when it comes to k self test itself we've noticed that there aren't necessarily patches that would go into like a 44 kernel to update k self test as patches were landing to fix particular problems in the kernel so what do you do um, you know you, you you end up sort of using aggressive skip lists for test suites that or for tests that are in K self tests are just not appropriate for that particular kernel version. Um, it just, it's just the way that it goes. Now, across K self test itself, there's a lot of inconsistencies as far as how the tests are designed, sometimes in the cases of uh, the setup that's required for those K self tests. Sometimes it's not necessarily intuitively obvious which kernel configurations you have to turn on. So, working with K self tests can be a little bit of an exercise exercise and frustration, but it's still well worth it. And as, uh, you know, as a body of tests, you know, if you've got time in, to put effort into putting patches to improve case self-test, please do. You are helping the universe at large when you do so. So, you know, take that into, take that into account if you've got some spare cycles. Um, another one that we use is LTP. Um, so LTP is kind of approaching things from the opposite angle. So where case self-test is ingrained and testing from the inside of the kernel, case self-test, or I should say LTP is from um, essentially coming down on user space. So it's running things like syscalls, it's running things like, you know, uh, some of the environmental stuff that's on top of Linux. And so it, you know, tries to tickle the kernel and, and find, um, you know, error cases um, in doing so. So it is a test suite that's reasonably mature. Um, it's updated still about every four months. Um, and as a, as a, you know, test environment, we've, you know, we've, we've been fairly happy with it. Um, the one downside to LTP is when we want to be doing things with Android, uh, there are, you know, vast swaths of LTP tests that just don't run on any operating system but traditional Linux itself. And it would be nice if that wasn't the case. Okay, so as I kind of mentioned, um, you know, when it comes to individual test suites, we, you know, we, we kind of see some best practices things that we'd like to see uh, generally cleaned up. Um, we do run CTS, we do run VTS from um, the land of Android. Um, and VTS in particular does contain an internal copy of case self-test and LTP, you know, highly, you know, selective as far as what they run. They don't run all of those, those test suites, but they, you know, pare down to something that's appropriate for the Android environment. Um, and this reflects back into what I sort of had mentioned before with LTP in so much it makes assumptions as far as sometimes the hardware that it's running on. Um, like, for instance, they'll somehow, sometimes they'll go out and they'll make a three gig file. Well, if you're on a small embedded device, making a three gig file may not fit into the size of the EMMC that you have on the device. <laughs> so, you know, you have to sort of uh, run into these, these tests and, you know, throw them out because they're just not appropriate. Um, for the environment. Um, there is, unfortunately, across, you know, a lot of these test suites, there's just no unified standard for doing reporting of results and logs and errors and skip lists. And so, you know, in designing a system like this, we sort of had to munge things together. Um, if you were to talk earlier today by Tim Bird, for instance, he was complaining that, you know, really tests need to have a universal ID so that when you do comparisons, um, you know, you could do that effectively by knowing, okay, this test is really the same test, you just ran them on two different architectures, and that's something that should not be hard. Um, it, would be, it would be really good if, again, we could find some sort of standard. Um, so on the case of um, reporting, um, you know, it's interesting that even like VTS and CTS, even though they're both from the Android universe, they come at reporting completely differently. <laughs> um, and so that results in inconsistencies. K self test, when it runs, it throws its logs into slash temp. Uh, you know, it just, these things layer by layer, you have to kind of tear them apart and, and work with them. Um, okay, so let's move on to um, Android. And so I've mentioned that we work with the Android common kernel. And so, of course, you know, this is everything from mainline all the way through the LTS versions from 4449, 414. Um, the thing about the Android common kernel is it's largely in sync with LTS, so when a new LTS release comes out, the Android common kernel rebases to that. But then it has a set of um, 
out-of-tree kernel patches. And the out-of-tree kernel patches has been largely decreasing in size, um, which, is, which is generally a good thing, but it still results in the Android common kernel is different than the Linux upstream. Um, and what we found in our, in our testing to detect kernel regressions is that open embedded is the operating system that we put our most time and effort into finding problems. And so open embedded, you know, anything that we find there typically isn't going to result in something that's going to spill over into the Android common kernel. Um, anything that then is, you know, showing up as a regression in the Android common kernel tends to be actually from that, you know, set of out of tree kernel patches. So that's it's kind of a nice little way how things how things work. But we have a bit of a blind spot because as I mentioned, VTS contains a subset of LTP and it contains a su subset of case self test because it's just not able to run everything. So, you know, this kind of doesn't feel right. You know, we like to again have parity in our testing so that it doesn't matter if we're on Android or if we're on open embedded, we can run everything. Um, but again, at least, you know, today, you know, open embedded is, is really our, our lead operating system and, and it does seem to do a really good job in, in finding, finding issues. Okay, so as I mentioned before, just when it comes to keeping up with LTS as a project, there's, you know, maybe one to two, sometimes three LTS releases on the average week. And we have, you know, as I mentioned, we've got that 48-hour window that we have to deal with, and typically our turnaround time is, is we'll get results um, back in about eight hours. So if you think about that, there's really two ways to look at that process. There's building, running, and results. And that's results if you have everything that's green, everything worked out really, really well. And then you have that situation where you have an error and you have to figure out what's going on. Did you have something that went wrong with your infrastructure? Do you have something that went wrong with a board? Do you have something that went wrong for a particular family? So maybe it was across all of the ARM architecture where an error showed up. Maybe it was something that was specific to one board and you know, one particular kernel. So you have to sort of take a look at the data in you know, a number of contexts and figure out what all, you know, what's going on. And ultimately you want to bisect and end up with a fix that then you can report back. That's really, really hard to do in a 40-hour window. Um, matter of fact, I would say it's, for the most part, unless it's something pretty obvious, it tends to be next to impossible. You can bisect to say that this is probably the bad patch, but taking it that next mile and saying, well, here's exactly what you need to do to fix that, that's, that's where the difficulty comes in. Okay, so I want to start going through some examples, um, what LKFT puts out and ultimately what we report. So the very first thing I want to sh start out with is our most important me reporting mechanism. That's by email. So if you're on the stable uh, Linux kernel mailing list, um, so stable at V'ger, uh, you, what you will see occasionally is you'll see these reports pop up from LKFT. And again, it's a little bit of an eye test, but what we try to do in this email summary is to put up very, up at the very top is to say, everything worked, no regressions, you know, no need to look any further in this email. That's all you need to know. Everything just worked. Um, if there is a failure, then we'll pop that in up at the top and we'll, we'll try to put in as much detail as far as what's going on to kind of help um, the community at large figure out what's going on. Um, what's kind of neat here too is if you look down at the list, then that's kind of a, a breakdown of how we shard tests. So you know you can see LTPs, file cap tests, and FS tests, and huge TLB tests, and IO, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of you know something that we could probably roll up in report a little bit better. But right now we've we've kept that broken out just to give um, everybody an idea of what exactly it is that we're running. And then we break it down by um, the architecture and the board combinations, which since we've added more and more boards, that's gotten that email to be pretty long. So again, that's something we probably need to look at. Okay, so besides email, um, we also have a web UI. So this is QA uh, qareports.linero.org. And so this is an example page specifically from 414. And so if, um, if we had the, the whole window here, you know, it would go down to 414.19 and so on and so forth, 
through time. And so we keep a, keep a long history of what's been going on. And in one of these, you know, so at the very top of the green one, you can see all the test runs that are there, and this is all something that's available on Live Links. The other thing that we have here up at the top, or I should say about in the middle of the page, is this is the metadata that goes with this particular build. So we think it's very, very important that we give enough information to have the, the commit IDs, the exact branches that were in use, and that includes not only the kernel, but the test suites that were involved, you know, the whole kit and caboodle, so that somebody can go and replicate this entire build outside of our own lab. They don't have to pick up our binary images to, to replicate everything. They can rebuild it specifically from source two if they want to. Um, that reproducibility is, is just huge in our world. Okay, so now in the case that there's an error, I've gone ahead and, and pulled out a, uh, um, this was again from back in February, an environment, a time where we had uh, something where, where eight failures had popped out, and so this is something where, you know, if you're a triage engineer and you're looking at this wondering what's going on, you can click on it, and this will take you to a, a report page that's gonna look about like this. And so this is one of those cases where, again, you're looking for trends you know, early on in the, in the stage. You're saying, okay, was this something that's just, just affecting one board? Is it affecting a whole architecture? Is it affecting, you know, all of, you know, everybody? In which case, you know, maybe this is a generic, you know, Linux kernel issue, and, you know, therefore the, uh, you know, importance of trying to get to the bottom of it, in, you know, increases. Um, the other thing, of course, that you can see on this, this particular page then is you can see, you know, just for the LTP syscalls, you can see how many tests there were and how many passed. And, um, you also notice that there are skips. And the reason why those skip numbers are so big is because there are tests in LTP which are not appropriate for all architectures. And so this is all sort of conglomerated together in the numbers that you're seeing. So when we look at a particular test run then, so we're looking at now at, at one of the particular failures. This is on the 32-bit version. So the test environment is X15, so that's a, like I mentioned before, that's a 32-bit TI board. Um, we'll see, here's our, two, here's our two tests that failed. Now, in this case here, it's actually not two tests. It's just one. Um, the run LTP syscalls, that's actually the name of the shell script that runs that then kicks off a number of activities, and it's one of the sub-activities that failed. So that's the FA notify 06 that actually failed. But the nice thing that we've got in this environment then is, is we can go back and you know, click on that link off on the right-hand side that says show info. You'll see the log. Um, that's, that's there for that particular test run for that individual test case. So you're not looking at some huge file if you don't want to. You can zero down, down in on the individual data. Um, another particular view that we consider very, very important is the historical information. Because as it turns out, there are test, suite, test suites that have flaky tests. And it'll be phase of the moon, it'll be different weather conditions, sunspots, whatever you want to call it, that test will work, and then it'll fail, and then it'll work, and then it'll work, and it'll work, it'll work for six weeks, and then it'll fail. And it, tracking those things down is really not any fun. It's an exercise in frustration. Now, in this case here, we're looking at something where we've got a real bright line. It fails all across the board, and it was working um, prior on, on at least the ARM architectures, but on, um, on some of the other ones here, it was a skip. Now, that pr probably brings up an interesting situation. So we went from something that was being skipped on a 32-bit ARM device to now something that's failing. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so as a triage engineer, what we do is um, we have our team go out and we create bugzilla entries. And so we start to collect you know, data and get everything here in preparation for handing off to appropriate teams. Because if you have something that's a kernel error um, that is only specific to a particular board, what you wanna do is you wanna bring in the team that supports that particular board and hand it off to them. Because it's probably not something that's a generic kernel issue. It's probably something that's more just specific to their environment. Um, so anyways, this is the particular bug entry that went uh, with this uh, particular LTP failure. And now this brings together um, another part of what I wanted to call out was, this was a test case issue. So when you notice before, back in that trend um, page, so on this one right here, so it wasn't running on X15. And then suddenly it was running on X15, or at least it had been attempted and it failed. Well, that was because uh, what had happened is that the test had been updated. So our system right now, it doesn't really have a great way of calling out that, oh, by the way, we just upgraded LTP, so the test case might have changed, so therefore, you know, something might have come from that. <clears throat> but in, the, in, the, in this case right here, there was a, a 
small update to the test. This is actually the fix that was, um, that was on the LTP mailing list, and so this one was just a, a test case issue. It was not something that was involving the Linux kernel in general. It was not a regression, you know, for the most part, not a, not a big deal. But that's not always the case. Um, in this case here, this is something that was from the huge TFBFS tests, and so uh, we had noticed something going on where, um, you know, you get the failure in the huge TFBFS tests that we run, it's something that we were able to bisect. We'd go ahead and throw this out onto the Linux kernel mailing list and, you know, notify the maintainer, hey, thank you so much for, you know, the, the report, you know, we, we did our jobs. And therefore, you know, this bad patch was found, it was fixed, everything was, was kosher, which was great. Um, and that brings me to another thing that I, you know, I really want to point out here is while we're testing LTS, and we're testing mainline, and we're testing Android Common, the place that we find where the most regressions are is actually on mainline. So just like you would expect, you know, the most interesting place to do Linux kernel development is on the mainline kernel. You know, no surprise here. And it's also, you know, you can see with regular, um, you know, it's just the regular cycle. So when RCs open up with RC1, you have the most current regressions that pop out, and that gets detected by the system. As you go through the RC cycles and get down to RC6 and RC7, those things disappear. Um, so it's, it's kind of, I think, affirming that the system is finding those things, it is seeing, and you know, that kind of helps you know, solidify in our minds that this is a good way to detect um, kernel regressions. Now, you know, we don't run every test suite on the planet. We think there are a lot of test suites that are probably need to be written yet. You know, more to be done, but at least this is a good start. <coughs> okay, um, getting involved. Um, the biggest area that I think that people can, can get involved and help things out is actually in the upstream world. So, you know, there's the Linux stable list. So when an, you know, an RC comes out, you know, taking, at, uh, taking a crack at those patches, picking them up, you know, compiling them in those kernels and, you know, working with them in your world, you know, that's, that's a contribution to the community and that's, that's really meaningful. Um, you know, working with the mainline RCs, same thing. That's a really valuable thing to go off and do and spend, spend time and effort on. Um, improving tests and the test suites themselves, that's also a very, very good thing to go off and do. Um, so getting involved with case self-test, you know, getting involved with LTP, you know, helping that kernel maintainer out who has a, you know, set of, of case self-tests, or maybe they don't even have any case self-tests at all. Maybe we can help, you know, you can help convince them to do that and you can just, you know, give them tests. That's a really, really, you know, good thing to do to, to uh, make the universe better, which is kind of what this, is, this project is really all about, you know, finding these kernel regressions so that we as a kernel community can you know, stand by our promise that we gave you a reliable kernel and we just gave you some fixes and we didn't regress those, those fi you know, we didn't regress the kernel so that you can, you know, continue to have um, confidence in, in what's, been, uh, what's been given to you. And, you know, for us as a project going forward, you know, we do think that more boards and more eyes ultimately are going to be making a, a difference. Now, in our board farm, you know, we don't have a lot of boards. But we do have plans where we will um, be talking at Connect next week about how, um, you know, others can basically pick up Lava and LKFT and be able to run their own remote labs. You know, we, we think this is something that, you know, we would like to see more of and, and help out and make that easier to do. Um, you know, working with Lava is a little bit of a challenge, at least it has been, but we've, we've put a lot of time and effort to, uh, to make that easier. So um, look, for, look for that talk to be online here in, uh, I'm guessing, probably about two to three weeks. So, you know, another piece of this, you know, making the world better story is, you know, exercising more tests. And <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily mean exercising kernel tests either. You know, it can be just running user space code as well. You know, is that necessarily an effective way of finding kernel regressions? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, we have seen instances where, for instance, um, there was an LTS regression. It only got detected because DHCP broke. And it wasn't every version of DHC, of DHCP clients. So the embedded DHCP clients were just fine. It was actually, um, you know, one that was um, the DHCP client that was on Ubuntu that found it. So, 
you know, don't just take away from this that it's only case self-test and you have to have kernel um, tests in order to find things. So that's it. Um, I guess I'll open the floor up to questions if everybody has one, and thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Yes? Uh, do you find that you uh, find problems that every time you run these aggressive tests, there's like a few releases that you'll find one? How often do you find something? Um, so with LTS itself, LTS is really, really stable. It's a really rare day that you'll find a regression there. Um, in the case of, again, like mainline, like I mentioned before, that, you know, RC1, you're going to probably have maybe like 10 regressions that'll pop up from an average RC1 that we've seen. Yes, question. Okay, so the question is, is um, the compiler wasn't listed in the metadata. So there's a little twist, twisty on that particular page. And so if I expanded it out, there's a whole bunch of information that would, would get included in the compiler is one of those. Um, LKFT is a project, we, we're just about at that point where we're gonna start turning on the ability to run multiple compilers. Um, so, you know, Clang built kernels in particular is something that really, really is interesting to us. Well, if there aren't any other questions, again, thanks for coming, and feel free to talk to me later.